Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Dialects Gun Podcast, where we critically engage in philosophy and correlate philosophy research to contemporary is- issues at an easy to understand and digestible level. My name is Sara Shavastava, and I'm your host. This week, we're joined by Professor Jeff Zebo, who is a clinical associate professor of environmental studies and an affiliated professor of bioethics, medical ethics, philosophy, and law at New York University. Hi, Professor Zebo. How are you today? Hi, I'm great. Thanks for having me. Of course, thank you for your time and for being here today. Before we begin our discussion, I ask all my guests this one question, and I want to ask you as well, how do you get into philosophy and what stood out to you? Oh, wow. Uh, I could could take the entire interview answering that question. I got into philosophy for various reasons. Honestly, when I was in high school, I thought I was going to be an artist, and I wanted to study areas where I would learn interesting ideas and it would challenge my thinking and my beliefs and values and it would give me something interesting to think about and say through my art. And so my original motivation was to study philosophy in college so that I would challenge my my beliefs and values and, and find interesting things to say through art. But then philosophy really captivated me for its own sake. I, I went to college and I started taking philosophy classes and they really challenged a lot of my fundamental beliefs about reality and about knowledge and about beauty and value. And it was all very destabilizing and, and, and exciting. And, and I, I really wanted to get to the bottom of it. And so I basically spent the next four years focusing on these questions about metaphysics and epistemology and ethics and existentialism. And by the time I was ready to figure out what was next, I was was so in love with philosophy that I wanted to keep studying it in grad school, and 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 then I stuck with it and and found my way into a career as a philosophy professor, and and so yeah, I I had these initially instrumental reasons for studying it, but came to see its intrinsic value too. That's awesome. And then just a quick question on like you know this art kind of story. So were you like yeah. planning on taking like aesthetics or like what exactly mm-hmm. in philosophy were you planning on taking? Not necessarily aesthetics. I I was really, really inspired by some uh, artists, uh, filmmakers and, and cartoonists and, and other people who, who I knew happened to study philosophy. As one example, like most people in, in my demographic and generation, I was really into the, the comic strip Calvin and Hobbes when I was growing up and in high school. And Bill Watterson, the artist of Calvin and Hobbes, was a philosophy student. And that really came out in in the the comic strip it was really kind of deep and profound and engaged with these questions and metaphys and epistemology in a fun way for a general audience and and so that was a kind of exemplar that inspired me when when i was thinking about what kind of artist i wanted to be i knew that i wanted to not only learn the technical skills of art but also really have something to say so so that the art would be worth engaging with and and so that was the motivation it was really the big big questions, not just philosophy of art, although that really is big and important too, but, but the big questions of philosophy about, about reality and knowledge and truth and beauty and goodness and rightness and so on. Awesome. And then like constructing that into your art, I'm assuming. Exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And I guess like just a f- quick fun question. Do you consider yeah. your work now, like your books, your essays and, and all of that, do you consider that art <laughs> well, I guess I would have had to spend more time studying philosophy of art in order to have a thoughtful answer to that question. I, I will say that I have continued to do art for fun over the years. So, so I, I mainly produced visual art when I was in high school. And then when I was in college, I did some satire writing. And when I was in grad school, I did some improv comedy and when I was an early career professor, I made some music. And so I always had these kind of creative outlets on the side. And that was really creatively fulfilling and, and complementary to my academic work. And then there are all of these kind of interesting structural parallels. Like when you, when you study improv comedy, it teaches you all of these things about the structure of a show and how the different scenes fit together and how it creates a kind of narrative arc. And you learn how to collaborate and how to connect with your audience. And, and those skills in, in various ways have kind of translated to my academic work, my, my speaking and teaching. And similarly, the, the structure of ideas and lyrics and music can, can be mirrored in interesting ways in the way you set up sections and paragraphs and sentences and books and articles. So I do think that there is uh, really an interesting connection there. And, and one final thing to say about this, more generally, I really believe strongly that there are interesting connections 
in general between philosophy and comedy because both in various ways are invitations to think critically about commonly accepted and taken for granted beliefs and values and practices. Really the only difference is in the, the way that we talk about it, right? In philosophy, we say, in this paper, I will reveal an inconsistency between this belief that we have and this belief that we have and argue for a way of resolving this inconsistency, right? And then in a stand-up show or some other comedy show, you might have someone reveal that contradiction in, in a more implicit or entertaining or humorous way. But in both cases, the structure is the same. I present to you an inconsistency and invite you to, to think with me about how to resolve it. And, and the only difference is in the mode of expression. So yeah, all sorts of interesting parallels to explore. And, and I love that we have started this conversation by talking about this. Yeah, of course. I mean, of course, like, I mean, comedians definitely by far are some of, I guess, they're actually great philosophers. Some of the questions that you explore in those like stand up, you know, kind of shows are like really, really interesting. And, you know, just like the material that they take and have a comedic outlook on it, but like a really philosophical right. outlook on it is really, really, yeah. you know, it's admiring. Like you have to admire that art and that craft for sure. But now let's Definitely. talk about, I guess, animal ethics, which is like the entire podcast today. Um, and before <laughs> we get into like the specifics um, on like on your book, I wanted to discuss mm -hmm. like the field of animal ethics with mm -hmm. you. So what are some central questions that you explore and um, you know, mm -hmm. how are they resolved within the field of animal ethics? Yeah, great. So, so there are a variety of questions that we ask in animal ethics, both theoretically and practically. So theoretically, we ask a lot of foundational ethics questions in a way that includes animals. So for example, questions about moral status, to whom do we have moral obligations in the first place and why, right? Do we have obligations only to fellow humans or rational beings? If so, why? Or do we have obligations much more expansively to all sentient beings, everyone capable of experiencing pleasure and pain and happiness and suffering and other subjective welfare states, or even all living beings, any being that evolved as part of the tree of life and aspires in its own way to survive and grow and self-replicate, right? What, what is the basis of moral status? And then we have to ask all of these uh, uh, theoretical ethics questions about what we actually owe these moral subjects or moral patients. So, so if we do have obligations, for example, to sentient animals who can feel pleasure and pain and happiness and suffering or to all living animals, then, then what do we owe them? Should we respect their freedom and autonomy? Should we promote their happiness and reduce their suffering? Should we uh, engage in a caring relationship with them in some other kind of way? So these are all the standard theoretical ethics questions about to whom we have obligations and, and what we owe them. But then practically in applied ethics, we also have to then contend with the fact that humans interact with really quintillions of animals per year. And, and we harm and kill at least trillions of animals per year in all sorts of ways, uh, in, including our food systems, where we, we kill more than 100 billion captive animals per year and one to three trillion wild animals per year for food alone. And then research, at least 100 million animals per year used for biomedical research. And then other animals in captivity, for example, in, in circuses and zoos and aquariums uh, and in our own homes. And then of course, our interactions with wild animals through deforestation and development and our transportation systems, and then just the effects of human consumption and pollution and human caused climate change affecting animals all over the world. When you think about the full scale of our actions with animals and think about how many of these animals are vulnerable, sentient, uh, trying to find their way in a world and experiencing a lot of suffering in many cases because of the effects of human activity, that raises a lot of really challenging applied ethics questions about how we might be able to harm them less and help them more and whether we should do that. So I have two quick questions here. So first is you were mm -hmm. talking about kind of like maximizing pleasure and minimizing suffering. And I guess I wanted to mm -hmm. ask um, the relationship between normative ethical theories and animal ethics. Is there like mm -hmm. a relied upon kind of normative ethical theory that the field utilizes, i.e. like utilitarianism, or, or is there like a lot of different normative ethical theories um, mm -hmm. in, in the context 
of animal ethics. And then the second question would be, um, are there subfields within this field, like certain mm -hmm. researchers, like focusing specifically on either specific cases, specific types right. of questions, or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, you know, different responses in applied ethics? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so with respect to normative ethics, there are many different normative theories, as your listeners might know. So utilitarianism says ethics is all about consequences and we should try to do the most good possible by increasing pleasure and decreasing pain in the world. And then you have uh, various non-consequentialist theories like, like Kantianism or rights theory. And, and those essentially say ethics is less about promoting pleasure and more about respecting rights and autonomy, right? Leaving others alone and letting them live their own lives. And then you have theories like virtue theory that says ethics is really about being a good and virtuous person and treating others in virtuous ways by expressing respect and compassion towards them, for example, as well as feminist care ethics that says ethics is really about uh, affirming the value of, of care and, and nurturing and emotion and, and uh, creating caring relationships with everyone with whom we find ourselves uh, in a relationship and, and building shared social and political and economic structures that can support us in having caring relationships with each other, right? So there are these different frameworks, maximize happiness, respect rights, cultivate virtues, cultivate relationships of care. Now, with respect to those various ethical theories, normative theories, I will say utilitarianism in particular, the one that says ethics is about maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain, that one has a special relationship with animal ethics because it was really the utilitarians like Jeremy Bentham back in the day who first perceived the importance of including non-human animals in our moral circle. Jeremy Bentham in some of his earliest foundational utilitarian writings noted that if ethics is really about maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain, then we should really include within our moral circles anyone who can experience pleasure and pain independently of whether they are a member of my nation or generation or species, right? Uh, and, and so he, he very famously said, the question is not, can they talk or can they reason, but rather, can they suffer? That is the question that we should be asking. So utilitarianism, to its credit, has a special his history of being out in front on this issue. And some other frameworks like, like rights theory, Kantianism, they were a little bit slower to appreciate the intrinsic significance of animals. Kant thought animals only matter instrumentally because the way we treat them affects how we treat each other, but they have no value intrinsically, right? But, 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 but in the past 20 or 30 years, I would say 40 years in, in, in some cases, the other frameworks have caught up. And now the leading proponents of all of these frameworks recognize the intrinsic value of animals and the need to extend these frameworks in a way that can be inclusive of animals. So utilitarians say, yeah, we should promote animal happiness. Kantians and rights theorists say, yeah, we should respect animal autonomy. And, and then virtue and care theorists say, yeah, we should cultivate virtuous uh, character traits that allow us to express respect and compassion and, and build relationships of care towards and with non-human animals. That, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, it's, it's, it's cool to see, I guess, like the ways in which animal ethics and animal rights, I guess, are included in those different frameworks. Um, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of the times, like when you're like simply viewing it, uh, you know, like, for example, it was kind of confusing to me how in like virtue theory, you would include an animal in that just given that that mm -hmm. virtue is like, innately based off of a human but like I guess mm. formulations of what the human is kind of change as well over a period of time and which is a question so we'll get to that a little bit later but mm -hmm. I guess I wanted to ask in the ways uh, in which like animal ethics research is conducted so is this always in response to like a specific crisis i.e whether mm -hmm. or not like you know there's like mass murdering of animals or if there's like a catastrophe like the Australia right. fire or is it just like you know constant you know just goodness or like or good thoughts uh that kind of emulate around everyday experiences maybe yeah that's a great question and and it also is an opportunity to respond to the second part of your previous question which is what are the subfields right so so there are some subfields and and these are usually either organized in terms of ethical theory like you have the utilitarians doing their version and the kantians doing their version but also organized in terms of issues so for example there is a subfield in some community of people working on farmed animal welfare. 
because that one is especially important and neglected. And also a subfield and sub community of people working on wild animal welfare, because that one is likewise very important and neglected. And similarly with research uh, animals and companion animals and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and a subfield and sub community devoted to ethical questions concerning animal activism and advocacy. So what types of activism and advocacy are most ethical? What types of activism and advocacy are most effective? Should we really be only doing legal things or is it okay to sometimes do illegal things? Should we be doing moderate and incrementalist things or should we sometimes also do more radical and transformative things? And how should we go about thinking of that both in terms of principled assessments and in terms of pragmatic assessments? So there are all kinds of little subfields and subcommunities, but they overlap and interact. Now, with respect to the question, uh, does scholarship and engagement, does that happen in a way that responds to crises and current events, or does it happen in this kind of ongoing way? I would say the answer is both and. So this is a situation like, for example, global health and development, like poverty and hunger, where some of the main issues are kind of chronic, ongoing, global issues that largely are neglected and ignored or, or not appreciated, right? And so, so some of the biggest problems in the world are not these like momentary crises like, like a hurricane, but rather this ongoing problem that a huge percentage of the human population goes without adequate nutrition or, or, or clean, clean water and, and so on. And similarly, that we kill more than 100 billion animals per year for food in, in uh, captivity in ways that not only kill lots of animals, but also contribute to global health and environmental threats. And then similarly with the one to three trillion animals per year we kill for food uh, uh, in industrial fishing, right? Um, these are just chronic ongoing issues, but, but we do also see momentary crises that make these issues salient. And, and you mentioned uh, wildfires, you know, the, the Australia bushfires and Amazon wildfires from a few years ago, they made these issues salient. The Australian bushfires killed more than 3 billion animals we know about. And similarly, the Amazon wildfires killed lots of animals while contributing, of course, to climate change uh, and, and other health and environmental problems. More recently, there have been floods, there have been heat waves. Those have harmed human and non-human animals and disrupted supply chains in ways that affect human and non-human animals. And so the answer is both and. We try to address the chronic ongoing issues as much as possible, both in academic and in ad advocacy work. But then we also try to uh, use those crises as opportunities to raise awareness and, and stimulate discussion uh, and then redirect it towards the chronic issues as well. So on a context of like awareness in, in, in general, like do I guess like lawmakers and like companies listen to uh, like ethicists in the field of animal ethics? Because, you know, oftentimes like I'm I just like I've watched like a few documentaries on like, I guess, animal ethics in general. Like mm -hmm. we watch a few of them in school um, in, in your like biology class normally. Um, and like, you know, the, the kind of things that happen, especially like with farmed animal or in, on farms or like, you yeah. know, getting butchered, et cetera, all those things are like devastating. And it seems that those things are just increasing, but they're not decreasing at all. So yeah. um, like how exactly are animal ethics just listens to, it's like almost, it almost seems as if like, you know, this is actually a lot of things, I guess now with the political society, but it seems like there's a lot, like a sense of like hopelessness almost, uh, you know, drawn yeah. into these causes. Um, and so what exactly does that hopelessness mean? Is it good or bad? Um, and then B, how can we get, do these people listen and see how can we get them to listen if they don't? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so I can absolutely appreciate why it might feel a little bit hopeless. And I actually think an important part of doing this work well is to really internalize that sense of hopelessness. Be, because if, if you think this is too easy, then you will probably be engaging in it in a superficial way that is not actually addressing the issue and, and likely to do much good. At the same time, it would be a mistake to lean too far in the direction of hopelessness. Because first of all, the situation is not hopeless. And second of all, if you lean too far in the direction of hopelessness, that can be a license for inaction because you think, ah, the situation is hopeless. I might as well screw around while the world burns because there would be no point to trying to do anything, right? And so I think the key is to internalize the idea that this is neither easy nor impossible. This is instead possible but hard. And then think really, really carefully 
about what we might be able to do given everything we know about ourselves, our talents and interests and position in society so that we can work really hard to have a chance of making some kind of difference. And I will say that this is an area where philosophy has actually played a pretty important role in moving the needle in, in the West. So for example, it was the publication of the book Animal Liberation written by philosopher Peter Singer in the 1970s that really reignited the animal protection movement in the West. And, and then that corresponded with the publication of his article, Famine, Affluence, and Morality around that same time that played a pretty significant role in inspiring the modern effective altruism movement, which now includes animal welfare as one of its main cause areas and is putting millions and millions of, of philanthropic dollars behind this cause area. And philosophers more recently have also engaged with advocates and policymakers and other change makers. Just to use my own case as an example, I've served on the board of various uh, nonprofit organizations and have consulted with advocates and policymakers and written op-eds and given talks and, and contributed to UN policy documents and, and, and these kinds of uh, things. And, and that is just me and lots of other people are doing similar types of things. So I think there is a precedent for philosophers uh, playing some kind of role in making a difference in how people think about these issues in big picture terms and how people think about moral circle expansion and the importance of including animals in health and environmental advocacy and policy. But it does take uh, a willingness on the part of philosophers to reach out beyond academic philosophy and engage in other academic fields and also engage with academics, uh, sorry, uh, advocates and policymakers and other change makers. And it requires a willingness on the part of other academics and, and advocates and policymakers and other change makers to engage with philosophers. But that can happen enough. And so, so if we look for those opportunities, I think they are there. So essentially, to kind of summarize that, it's mm -hmm. hard, but it's possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. And I guess like we can talk more about your book now, um, which is you know titled Saving Animals, Saving Ourselves, Why Animals Matter in for Pandemics, Climate Change, and Other Catastrophes, which was published by Oxford Press in the March of 2022. And in it, you mentioned that you know the human and non-human fates are increasingly linked. Um, why is that the case? And you know, how are animals relevant to like the global order and like life as we know mm -hmm. it? We kind of already talked about the ways in which they're like ne necessary, but like how can we reconstruct what it means to be, I guess, like an yeah. animal or like a human uh, in these times? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I wrote this book arguing that human and non-human fates are linked uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One is that our use of animals is a very significant contributor to global health and environmental threats like pandemics and climate change. For example, our use of animals in factory farming and our interactions with animals in deforestation and the wildlife trade. These are major drivers, both of the spread of zoonotic diseases and of pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and then conversely, pandemics and climate change and other catastrophes impact human and non-human animals at the same time, right? We saw in COVID-19, that when a disease spreads all over the world, it can affect other animals too, because they can contract the disease and get sick. And then they might be subject to increase violence or neglect from humans. For example, we might cull or, or euthanize or depopulate uh, captive or wild non-human populations if we perceive them as a threat, as a vector for, for disease, right? Um, or when supply chain breakdowns cause economic disruption, then we might likewise call or, or uh, euthanize or depopulate animal populations because we have no use for them anymore during, during these economic disruptions and, and so on and so forth. And, so, and similar, similar things can happen with climate change, right? When climate change destabilizes our social and political and economic systems, that is going to have implications for human and non-human animals. Climate change is going to cause you know, ice caps to melt and sea levels to rise and coastal areas to flood and an increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events like floods and fires. And then of course, that all affects all of, all of life on this planet, including other animals. And, and when climate change displaces animals, when it drives them from their homes and they go in search of other sources of food and water and, and places to, to build their homes, then guess what? Humans are once again, 
going to kill them because instead of seeing them as vectors for disease, we're, we're going to see them as invasive species, right? Instead of climate refugees, which is what they would actually be. Uh, we, we saw Freya the walrus being killed uh, uh, recently. And that was because the walrus was a, a climate refugee, but instead of uh, welcoming her accordingly, uh, humans killed, killed her, right? Uh, because they perceived her as a threat to their property. And so we really need to be thinking about these interactions, both about how our use of animals contributes to these global threats, and then how these global threats are going to impact us all. And we need to include animals in our global health and environmental advocacy and policy by first of all, making it a priority to reduce our use of them as part of our pandemic and climate change mitigation efforts. And second of all, make it a priority to increase our support for them as part of our pandemic and climate change adaptation efforts and really try to have this holistic uh, animal welfare and global health and environmental policy that can be uh, helping humans and animals and the environment at the same time. So what does that like second or like the latter part of that look like when you're supporting animals throughout like I guess mm -hmm. pandemics and or you know kind of these catastrophes etc what does that look like? There are all kinds of short-term policy interventions that you could pursue. Some of it is really basic like like pursuing more research and advocacy so that we have more knowledge and power and political will for helping animals. But then it also might mean using uh, education and employment policy to include more material in middle schools and high schools and, and colleges about what animals are like and how humans and non-humans interact and how we can improve our interactions with other animals. And then we can fund the creation of new jobs where people can be supporting Animals, for example, in the original New Deal, there were all of these public works programs where people were hired to be stewards for the environment. They took care of the environment. And this was a way to put people to work and help the economy, but also a way to take care of the environment. When, when we implement new just transitions, a, a, a kind of green New Deal, so that we can transition away from the current food and, and energy and transportation systems that are harming the environment. And we can supply people with good green jobs that they can have instead of those bad ones. We could think about jobs that people can use so they can take care of animals and the environment, right? Uh, and then similarly, when we uh, think about new infrastructure, when we think about what kinds of cities and food and energy and transportation systems do we need to build so that we can have a more resilient and sustainable uh, global and local infrastructure. We can include animal welfare and think about what kinds of infrastructure changes might be co-beneficial for humans and other animals. For example, when we uh, upgrade building requirements so that buildings will be more energy efficient, we can also upgrade those building requirements to have so that buildings have bird-friendly glass to reduce the, the collisions with, with birds. And similarly, when we build new transportation systems, we can include overpasses and underpasses and wildlife corridors to again, reduce collisions with animals. And we can also think really better about uh, how we use light in cities in a way that will be better for insect populations and other populations that, that can suffer because of light pollution and so on and so forth. There's just all of these well-hanging fruit ways to help humans and animals at the same time through infrastructure, if only we think to include animals as part of those conversations. Okay, so I guess like I have two points here, or like I guess two mm -hmm. questions here. So it seems that mm -hmm. these kind of changes resolve or revolve around two central ideas. The first being including animals in your moral circle, and the second mm -hmm. revolving around capitalism and kind of the way in which we mm -hmm. uh, spend money on certain things. I'm assuming that most of the reasons that these things don't happen is because it's cheaper not to do that. And so I guess my question first, and then we'll get to the moral circle question, but the first yeah. question would be like, what is the relationship between capitalism and animal rights? Or I guess like, you know, yeah. just even thinking about uh, specific things that are going to, you know, help animals. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and it gets to these really foundational questions that come up. The, the answers I just gave are things that we can do in the short term in the context of our current social and political and economic systems. But then there is this deeper question that is raised by what, what you asked, which is, should we also consider revisions or replacements to our fundamental social and political and economic systems? Should there be fundamental changes to our conceptions of liberalism and democracy and capitalism, right? Um, so, so you noted that part of why we do this is we perceive it as cheaper. And I think that is true. We, we see it as economically efficient to exploit and exterminate animals in, in this way. Now, one thing to note 
is that we are wrong about that. It, it appears to be economically efficient and, and cheap for us to use animals in this way. But then when you consider all of the negative externalities, not only the animal welfare impacts of the exploitation and extermination, but also all of the global health and environmental impacts that we then have to use public funds to clean up. Once you then factor in all of that cleanup and, and mitigation and adaptation expense, it actually turns out that these interactions with animals are really expensive. And so it would, it would be much cheaper in, in, in the aggregate in total, it would be much cheaper to grow plant-based foods, for example, and, and uh, not use animals in these ways that are driving these health and environmental impacts. Uh, we spend much less money in the long run when, when we take animals out of these economic systems. And, and so there is room to make a capitalist case for uh, not using animals in these ways, for reducing our use of them and increasing our support for them, because in the long run, it improves global health and environmental outcomes in ways that are ultimately good for humans and can help us grow our economies more efficiently and, and sustainably. So, so, so even within capitalism, I think there is a case for it. Now, with that said, I think there is also a case for, for promoting animal welfare and rights from within other economic systems. And so as we have this big debate about whether we should be aiming for a capitalist future or an anti-capitalist future or some kind of socialist middle ground, future, uh, I think there is room to, within all of those frameworks, ask how animals can be included as, as sort of members of society and, and uh, beings who can own things rather than as objects who are owned as, as things. Okay, that makes sense. And, you know, I, I think probably like the calculations on like the economic side probably make sense given that, you know, there's like a lot of research in this already, but like, mm -hmm. you know, the ways in which, you know, animals are exploited right now actually leads to more money being spent to clean up the effects mm -hmm. of those things. Uh, That's right. just, I don't know. It's just, I don't know why we're not able to see that, but um, the, the, I guess like, we're the good at question, hiding it. Very, very good. Apparently. Um, the yeah. second question I have is about like the mindset shift into kind of including animals in your moral circle. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of people, and I think this is just kind of maybe the way that they're brought up or how education system is, you know, teaches us values. I don't think a lot of people evaluate kind of animals to be in their same moral circle as them. Um, mm -hmm. And so like, you know, an example I was thinking of in, in my mind, right, is like, let's say you're driving and you see a squirrel cross on the road. And so you either have to, you know, you either have the decision to run it over, the squirrel dies, or steer left and veer into another car where two, two people are bound to get injured, <laughs> right? Right. And in that scenario, I don't know what the correct answer is. Like I'm thinking right. about it, hypothetically speaking, and I don't know what, you know, there's obviously a lot of reasons I go into it. Like there's the economic factors of like repairing cars. There's like the actual consideration of health for two human beings. And so right. in that scenario, there's like a lot of different kind of factors that go into it for sure. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm sure most people would just lean into killing that squirrel for the sake of two human beings and kind of preservation of human life. So in yeah. that scenario, is there a problem in that moral, like moral decision? Or are you saying that like, you know, humans should be at the same level in the moral circle as animals yeah. or just to yeah. be included? Because even right. if they're just included, it seems that there's some sort of like distinction that would kind mm -hmm. of recreate the same problems that animal ethicists are talking about, right? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so, and, and I really like the way that you set it up because it, it allows us to make this distinction between, you know, do they count at all? And then how much do they count, right? And, and so just as a baseline, we can simplify the case and, and say, you are driving down the street, you see a squirrel standing there and you can, with no cost to anyone at all, swerve around the squirrel and preserve their life, right? In that case, it seems pretty clear that instead of for no reason running over the squirrel and, and causing them suffering and death and, and causing their families to, to lose a family member, instead of doing that, if you can just drift around them and go on with your day, clearly you should do that, right? And I think that kind of case and lots of other cases like that establish as a baseline that they do matter at all. Like they, they do have some intrinsic moral value. And, and so that already means that we should include them in our moral circle. And now the only question is the one that you asked, how much do they count? And, and what do we do if we perceive trade-offs between our interests and, and their interests, right? Do we say our interests always win or, or do we do some kind of math? And what does that math look like? 
So that ends up getting really complicated, but, but, but let me give you an illustration of what the discussions look like. One, one view is everyone who matters matters equally, right? If you matter at all, then you matter equally. And, and there is some appeal to that because like we all count as one individual and we have our own life and we have our own interests and needs and vulnerabilities. And if we start getting in the game of ranking people, you know, like if we start getting in the game of saying you matter more than you because you are like smarter or more talented or something, then that could have really pernicious effects within the human population too. Do we feel comfortable ranking humans based on things like how smart or talented you are or, or your capacity for welfare, right? Uh, so some people say, no, we should say that everyone who matters matters equally. And if that means that humans and non-humans matter equally in some sense, then so be it. And, and we should be prepared to accept that like our importance is, is not as, <laughs> we, that, that we are less dominant in terms of our importance than we initially thought, you know? Uh, a, a, an opportunity for some humility. Now, other people do think that ranking can be appropriate. For example, some people think that um, to the degree that humans have a, a higher capacity for welfare than non-humans, then we can matter more. Like, like if, yes, I matter and a mouse matters and an ant matters, but since I can suffer more than a mouse can, to that extent, I matter more than a mouse. And, and since a mouse can suffer more than an ant can, to that extent, the mouse matters more than an ant. So if a house is burning down and you can only save me or a mouse, but not both of us, you should save me because that prevents more suffering, right? Like I would suffer more in that fire than the mouse would. Um, now, now that I think kind of makes sense and is still consistent with a certain kind of egalitarianism. You can consider everyone's interests equally while still acknowledging that some of us have more interest than others, more welfare at stake, right? But, 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 but. But <laughs> that is not going to justify human supremacy or exceptionalism, because first of all, some non-humans might have higher capacities for welfare than us. Like an African elephant, they have three times as many neurons as humans. It is plausible that they have higher capacities for welfare, and so they would rank higher than us, according to this way of ranking beings. And second of all, there are so many animals in the world that even if I matter more than a mouse, it still might be that the total number of animals matters more than the total number of humans. So, so that's all just an illustration of how this gets really, really complicated. And we're only at the beginning of wrapping our minds around it. But I believe, and, and I'll shut up in a second, I believe that when all is said and done, we are going to have to come to terms with the reality that other animals and non-humans in general, they matter more than we do. Okay, that is... That is going to be some, that's, that's interesting. I mean, I don't know exactly how like the youth and I guess everyone kind of listening to this is going to take that, but you know, there's just, this is exactly what we want to learn and kind of figure out. And I guess like I have some more kind of hard take questions. So the first yeah. one um, is, should people go ve vegan? Why or why not? Okay. Briefly, I think in general, to the extent that we can reduce our complicity in, in harm in the world and suffering and death for vulnerable others, then we should make some effort to do that, right? Now, what, what that looks like for each of us is going to be different depending on our individual circumstances and our health and economic needs, right? Um, but to the degree that eating less meat and contributing less to this you know, industrial animal agricultural system that kills animals without the opportunity for consent and contributes to global health and environmental threats that disproportionately impact low-income workers and, and people in other nations in the global south and in future generations, again, often without the possibility of consent, to the degree that we can reduce our complicity in those systems while still living good and meaningful lives and taking care of ourselves and our families, I think we should do that. And for many of us, especially uh, relatively high-income people in the global north, I do think we can be uh, healthy and well we can, we can survive and flourish in life while eating no or, or relatively few animal products. And, and for those of us who can do that, I think we should. Is that the only thing that we should do? No, consumer 
uh, boycotts are only one of many interventions we should be participating in. We should also be participating in protests and elections and, and other kinds of collective political change. Um, but yeah, participation in consumer boycotts is, is part of what we should be doing to the degree that we can. Now, if, if you are in a situation where for health or economic reasons, you are not capable of abstaining from animal products entirely while taking care of yourself and your family, then do what you can, right? Uh, so, so we should all aspire to reduce the harm that we cause uh, as much as possible and, and, and do what we can as individuals. And, and if for some of us that means going vegan, great. If for others of us, it means very significantly reducing our meat intake while contributing to other types of change where we can, that is also great. I think we should all do what we can. That makes a ton of sense. And then the second question is about, I guess, pets. Should we be allowed to have pets? Uh, why or why not? Are there certain clauses that would allow people to take care of cats, et cetera? That's also a great question. I, I will say that I, I have a, an 11 year old, God, is he 10 or 11? He is in any case old, a <laughs> uh, 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 rescue dog named Smokey. I do think that living with non-human companions is a good thing to do. Generally speaking, to the degree that we can adopt rescue animals who need homes, that is generally preferable to buying animals from breeders. Uh, and, and in general, I think to the degree that we do live with animals, we should make sure that we adjust our lives in ways that give them an opportunity to have really good lives and be able to make choices and, and uh, exercise their natural instincts and so on and so forth. Um, so, so, you know, I make a point to play with my dog a lot, give him lots of socialization and take him on long walks and let him tell us where we go on walks and, and so on. Uh, and I think generally we should focus on um, uh, animals who are domesticated in a way that allows them to genuinely thrive in relationships with humans and, and not, for example, buy exotic pets, uh, wild animals who are really going to suffer in, in these conditions of captivity. Uh, and then in the long run, we should ask some serious questions about to what degree we should be breeding animals for various purposes, right? We currently breed animals for food and research and companionship and other purposes. And in each case, we breed them to have traits that we want them to have that are fun for us rather than traits that are good for them, right? So like in the case of food animals, we breed them to grow real big, real fast, and that gives them health problems. In the case of lab animals, we breed them to have cancers so that we can perform experiments on them. And in the case of many companion animals, we breed them to have like features that we find cute, even if they can cause health problems like smushed noses and, and so on. And so, so I think we really need to interrogate this practice of breeding animals to have features that we like, uh, rather than letting them come into existence on their own terms. Or if we do bring them into existence, focusing on them having traits that are good for them and, and better for them to flourish in life. So, so we do have these broader questions we should ask, but in the meantime, as they exist and they need homes, yeah, I think we should adopt them and give them homes to the degree that we can. Definitely, that makes sense. And I guess for any students who are like listening on this podcast, what is the benefit in like learning about animal ethics and maybe arguing for it? Because, you know, mm -hmm. I, I guess like for students who, you know, might be, I guess like obviously in school, maybe this might not be like their top priority or, you know, mm -hmm. on their even priority list. So what yeah. is like a benefit in like exploring these things or are these just more so kind of when you transition out of college and start thinking about a life or, you know, maybe like when you're doing like, I don't know, meal prep or something like that. You, these are questions that you yeah. have to kind of think about. Um, or is it just something that's, you know, like it's continuously banging on, on like the human, on the mind about like answering mm -hmm. these questions, et cetera. I think the sooner that you can, I mean, look, I study this, so of course I have a bias here, but I think that the sooner you can study this topic, the better, because it has all kinds of benefits for how you think about everything that matters to you. First of all, this is a really good case study in how human bias and ignorance can cause us to support systems of violence and oppression against vulnerable others, against their will, in a way that feels totally normal to us because of the society that we were raised in. When you study the topic, you realize how awful and limiting our narratives are that justify and rationalize what we do to other animals. And then when you see that, you can start to see how these, these systems of violence and oppression and these justifications and rationalizations are operating everywhere. And it really helps you take 
this really important kind of critical distance from humans and our beliefs and values and practices that can be valuable have in all kinds of domains. And there are also all sorts of interactions between oppression of humans and oppression of non-humans that it helps to be aware of. For example, we oppress humans in part by, by comparing them with non-humans who we see as lesser than, right? Part of how human oppression functions is through dehumanizing discourse that takes humans who are in certain social or biological categories and it frames them as animals, right? And, and so, so our oppression of animals supports oppression of humans. And in these ways, racism, sexism, ableism, ageism, and speciesism are in various ways, yes, different, but also similar and linked and mutually supporting, right? Uh, in, in various cases, these are, are in different ways, forms of discrimination against other individuals who matter on the basis of membership in morally irrelevant social and biological categories, including things like how smart are they and what are their bodies like and, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and, and so there are these quite important links between human and non-human oppressions. And again, that is not to say that they are the same. They are very different and they need to be treated differently uh, and, and worked on differently. But understanding and exploring the links actually helps us build coalitions and find common ground and really think more deeply and, and rigorously and systematically and get at the root causes of these different types of oppressions and problems that we care about in a way that can make work on any particular topic more ethical and more effective. Yeah, for sure. And if you're, I guess, like interested in learning more, you can definitely read Professor Zebo's book about animal ethics um, that just came out called Saving Animals and Saving Ourselves. Um, and I guess like to kind of like wrap this up, I wanted to ask, because I ask all my audience members, what are you doing now? Uh, what is your research focused mm -hmm. on now? Um, and, you know, obviously I can leave a link to your website. And then also if mm -hmm. you want to leave any organizations that students can get involved with, I can also mm -hmm. link that in the description as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so a lot of things happening now. Uh, I, I came out with that book that we discussed in the spring. And right now I'm in the process of launching two new programs at New York University. One is called the Mind Ethics and Policy Program. And this program is going to conduct research on uh, basically the consciousness and sentience and sapience and the moral and legal and political status of non-humans, including animals and artificial intelligences. So we really want to figure out what types of minds can be conscious and sentient and, and feel pleasure and pain and happiness and suffering. Do insects suffer? Is it possible that one day a sufficiently uh, sophisticated artificial intelligence could suffer? And if so, how can we build moral and legal and political frameworks that can protect their interests as well? And then the other program is called the Wild Animal Welfare Program. And this is going to uh, conduct research that examines what wild animals are like and how humans and wild animals interact and how humans can improve our interactions with wild animals at scale. Uh, and, and so these are two different areas of research that I'm going to be basically building and with some of my colleagues running programs about so that we can both conduct and stimulate a lot of research and, and conversation on those areas. So that'll be a big thing that I work on in the future. And then in terms of uh, organizations to be aware of, I mean, you can certainly follow our work at NYU Animal Studies if you want to understand some of the interesting and inspiring work being done in animal advocacy right now, you can look at the Animal Charity Evaluators website. Animal Charity Evaluators is an organization that I used to work on the board of, and it finds and promotes highly effective ways of helping animals. And so you can see lots of great examples of work people are doing to help farmed animals, to help wild animals, to support legal and political rights for animals, and to build grassroots movements so that more people in more cultures and countries care about animals. So that might be a good place to look. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much. That about wraps up our podcast today. Uh, thanks for your time and for being here. I learned a lot about animal ethics, and I'm sure I'll recommend, I guess, like listening to this podcast to all my friends. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for hosting it. I really appreciate it.